Maltese. Give us safe travels tonight, and in the name of Jesus I pray, amen. When you walk into the room, everything changes. Darkness starts to tremble in the light that you bring. When you walk into the room, starts burning and nothing matters more than just to sit there at your feet and worship you yeah and worship you sing it again when you walk into the room everything changes darkness starts to tremble at the light that you bring when you walk into the room every heart starts burning and nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet and worship you yeah and worship you Every hopeless situation ceases to exist. But when you walk into the room, the dead began to rise. And there is resurrection life in all you do. So come and consume God, all we are. We give you permission. Our hearts are yours. We want you, Lord. We want you, yeah. So come and consume God, all we are. We give you permission. Our hearts are yours. We want you. Lord, we want you. We love you, Jesus. We'll never stop. We can't live without you, Jesus. We love you. We can't get enough. Every bird in every ground. This is my surrender. Give it all to him. Here is where I lay it down. Every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. And I will make room for you. Do whatever you want to. Do whatever you want to, Lord. I will make room for you. Do whatever you want to. Do whatever you want to. But this is my surrender. This is my surrender. This 
I just want to sit here at your feet. You're caught up in this holy moment. Never want to leave. I'm not here for blessings, no. Jesus, you don't owe me anything. More than anything. I'm sorry when I just sang another song. Take me back to where we started and open up my heart to you. And I'm sorry when I come with my agenda. I'm sorry I forgot to show it up. Back to where we start and open up my heart to you. Caught up in your prison. I just want to sit here at your feet. Caught up in this holy. I 
Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Born of His Spirit, washing His blood, and what He did for. Is more than enough. So I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. And I trust in God, my Savior. Never fail. Perfect submission. Dull is at rest. And I know the author of tomorrow. Listen. Is order my steps. Hallelujah. So this is my story. This is my song. Praising my risen King and Savior all the day long. So I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He would never fail. And I trust in God, my Savior. Never fail. Cause I saw the Lord and he heard and he answered. I saw the Lord and he heard. And he answered, I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him, that's why I trust him. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him, that's why I trust him, God, my Savior. Who will never fail? He will never fail. I trust in God, my Savior. I 
trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Hallelujah, Lord. That's why mountains are still being moved. Strongholds are still being loose. God, we believe it. Yes, we can see it. Wonders are still what you do. Listen. Bodies are still being raised. Giants are still being slain. God, we believe Ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce to you Dr. Roberts Barrett. Give him a warm up. One, two, three. You may be seated. I'm going to preach from down here. Is that okay? Bring it back a little bit more in the light. That'd be great. So, just one is fine. So, how's everybody doing? Good. You guys talk back in this church or are you one of those quiet churches? If you're, if you're Pentecostal, you got to talk back. If you're a Baptist, you got to learn how to do that. So uh, I'm very excited to be here with your pastors. And uh, may I first say, what a nice auditorium in the middle of Indiana. You guys know how nice this auditorium is? It's, it's a big deal. I didn't expect, I expected wood, some trees and bushes and some stuff, you know. Christian decorations, and um, I was like, I never thought this would be behind those doors. So may I salute you and say what a beautiful auditorium, and you that are members of this church, you should be glad your pastor thinks this way. Thank you for the one amen on that point, but um, you know, if you want a dead pastor, they're everywhere. If you want a living pastor and a, and a moving pastor, they're hard to find sometimes, and so you should be happy about that. And uh, it's my first time in this part of Indiana. And uh, I like Indiana uh, because you're nice to me. <laughs> I've been coming to Indiana since I was uh, in my early 20s to see Lester Summerall in South Bend up north. And uh, it's easier to get to you than South Bend, I'll say that. You have to fly to Chicago and then take a vibrating plane from there to Indiana or South, south Bend. And uh, it takes a while to vibrate all the way over, just about an hour and a half. So, but it's easier to fly into Indianapolis and drive 35 minutes and it's a lot nicer that way. 
But uh, you have a, have a wonderful state. Before I do any other announcements, I wanted to, if you put those pictures up, I wanted to tell you where the name Hoosier came from. I first thought it came from, um, it, it came from a basketball group of guys. I used to preach in Bloomington when Mr. McKnight was, you know, the Pope over there. And um, I was there one night when they won a tournament and the whole town exploded. I wish my churches had exploded like that, but we were kind of dead that night. And but went outside and they were singing and dancing and jumping. I thought, wow, we're going to get this in the streets. But I discovered the name Hoosier came from a black preacher that came through this part of the country in the early parts of our, our, of our nation. Have you ever heard of Harry Hoosier? That's a little, ever heard of him before? All right, this is who he is. So let me tell you about him. And this is where you come from. So it's not Hoosier basketball team. This is him. He's a, a black preacher that uh, got anointed. And he was good friends with a man named Francis Asbury, one of the early Methodists. You've heard of Francis Asbury. Well, he drew more crowds and got more amens than Mr. Asbury did, if you want to be honest about it. And he would come into towns and convert the whole small town and run uh, the saloons and bars out of existence. And his followers would be called Hoosierites. And those were the followers. And he came to Indiana in the early parts of your, your, your founding. And... Uh, he had great success here. And so that's where the name Hoosier comes from, is from this little black preacher. You can look him up tonight and Google him. Google his name, he's going to pop up there. There's the Hoosier Project, and I think it's great. And he would, he would preach against slavery, which was the thing you should preach against back then, and injustice and against sin. He's one of those, he would preach sin out of you and out of your county. And then you become a Hoosierite, because y'all go to church and don't drink and live right. What a great Ike you became, a Hoosier Ike, all right? So I just thought I would mention that to you because I think tonight's good you know where some of these names come from because, you know, you were, were you know, Hoosier basketball, and like, no, great. I thought it was a coach. That's really what I thought. You know, that was probably a famous basketball coach or something. That's why this name got to going and da 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 Preacher. A black preacher in the days of slavery and that. And uh, so that's what I would mention that to you. So... When you, when, you, when you have a historian, I have to give you some history lesson first so that you know what's going on. I've written 99 books. How many's read all 99 yet? How many have read any of my books? Can I see your hand? Great. Uh, I brought some of them out in the back. When you, when you write so many books, you have to sell them in bundles. You can't sell them individual because it's just too much. So why you write so many? I, I, I'm only halfway done. I'm, a, I'm after 250 books before I'm dead. See why? Because I'm smart. I have a lot to say, and I can't say it one night, or you'd be here for a few months. I think I'm that smart. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, no, I have a lot to say, and you can't do it all. And plus, the Lord told me to write, write books. And I've, uh, I've uh, sold about almost 20 million books so far. And so uh, it's, it's not me. It's really the Lord's been really kind to me. A book will go where you never get to go. I like that. They're, my books are places that I'll never be invited because they don't want me there in person. They like me there in print. Uh, and there'll be places that I don't have time to go. And a book will go there. A, a book will live after you're dead. So I'll keep preaching when I've been in heaven shouting for a while. I'll still be going mm, down here through my books. And a book is a, is, a, is a spiritual bomb that'll sit on somebody's shelf or somebody's box and they open it up one day and they read it 50 years after I'm dead. And something in there will ignite something in them, and maybe something good will happen. And that's what I pray for. And I pray that uh, it'll bless you. I write three kinds of books. I write teaching books, uh, Christian teaching books. Then I write revival history books, the God Journals books. And uh, that's probably what I'm most known for. And then I help bring these. This is my biggest book. It's not a door stopper. It's a book. All right? I bring things that are out of print back into print. And uh, there's three books I want to mention to you here tonight. This is a, a thousand pages. Now, people get scared of this. You know, how do you read a big book? The same way you read a small book, one page at a time. All right, that's how you read it. You ever heard of John G. Lake? Yes. That's all of his unpublished sermons that his daughter gave me before she died. I had her in my car and when I lived in Tulsa. I was probably, what, 20 years old. And she'd spent the morning with Kenneth Hagin. And they needed a ride to go to Oral Roberts' office, which is on the other side of Tulsa. So I got to be the driver from Hagen's office to Oral's office. And so it's about a 10-mile journey. 
and Oklahoma or Tulsa breaks up their roads in one mile increments. Every mile you gotta stop. So I had 10 miles, then about 20, 25 minutes to get everything I needed to know and to make her my best friend. So I was just young and dumb and it worked. I said, do you have anything in your dad's I can have? <laughs> you have not because you asked not. And no's not offensive, it's just, I have to ask a different way. And, um, and we waited a whole mile before she said anything. And she goes, yes. I had to wait another whole mile to find out what I got. She only talked at stop signs, seems like. So when we got to the third stop sign, she goes, I'll give you all of my dad's unpublished sermons. I said, oh, thank you. And I'll give you a copy of all the family photographs. So I was very happy that day. So I said, what can I do with them? She goes, you can do whatever you want with them. I said, I'm gonna print them. She goes, all right. And that's what this is. These are all of his unpublished sermons. And if you don't know about John G. Lake, just one thing about him, he uh, had a great ministry. He brought Pentecost to South Africa. But when he finished there, he came back to America and went to, of all places, Spokane, Washington. Why in the world would you go to Spokane, Washington? But I guess God loves people in Spokane, Washington. He sent me to Marksville here, you know, so hallelujah. All right, folks, you're gonna have to laugh during the sermon too, all right? So get used to my sense of humor. And uh, he goes to Spokane, Washington, and he opens what we call the healing home, the healing rooms. Would you like going to a doctor's office, but instead of getting a shot and a prescription, you get verses and so much prayer you got to do and come back next week and they help build your faith up to get you a miracle. And they got 100,000 documented miracles in five years. Not his whole ministry, just in five years. Washington was awarded by the federal government to be the healthiest city in America at that time. The mayor of the city, when he received the award and all the benefits you get for that award, he thanked all the medical people in the hospitals and included John G. Lake's healing rooms in his appreciation for the health care of his city. And he's known to make great, if, if the doctors can't do it, go try Lake. They usually can fix the hard cases. And isn't that nicer that the mayor and the medical people know, well, try the funny people over there in that house. <laughs> they get stuff done and they respect him. So you'll enjoy all of this. There's an uh an index in the back, so you can hear that. Have you ever heard of Wigglesworth? Yeah. He, he's fun. He's British. I can't believe he's British because the British don't act like him today. The British are so conservative and, and almost spiritually dead in some places. Wigglesworth was an uneducated plumber that stuttered. He couldn't speak clearly. And uh, he was raised in a Methodist church. His grandmother took him, what do they call a shout Methodist. That's a Methodist that acts like a Pentecostal. And they shout when the power of God comes on them. And normally, most people act the same way in history. When the power of God comes, they all their hands go up and they start shaking and they get loud and they fall over. It's nothing new. It's called Holy Ghost and the flesh don't know what to do with the power that hits it and it reacts. So we've been acting the same way biblically and throughout church history. And so uh, he, he, he received the Lord and, and he was a young man and, and he joined the revival movement of the day, which was the Salvation Army. Now, that's hard for you to believe today because they're the bell ringers at Christmas time, ding, 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 ding. Go up to them at Christmas and get those bell ringers saved, would you please? Because the founder of it was a great revivalist. He and his wife, William and Catherine Booth, built the Salvation Army. What a great revival. It's, people ask me, who's your favorite revival people? And, and they expect me to pick a Pentecostal. I don't. I pick the Salvation Army people. They are fun people. They put the gospel and social justice together in a beautiful way. For example, the reason why you have a 10 o'clock break in the morning at work and a three o'clock break in the afternoon, Salvation Army. The reason why there is a, there is a protocol of uh, how to keep your health and safety in the workplace and in the buildings, Salvation Army. Salvation Army helped also the consent law uh, of sexual consent. You cannot have sex with someone until a certain age and da da da, -da Salvation Army. The Salvation Army founder and his son was walking across the London Bridge one night and he noticed up under the bridge there were little families in the British winter that were cold with little things of fire trying to keep warm with their children. And, they, and he looked up under and saw lots of them under that bridge. And he told his son, Branwell, fix this. And that's where the shelter sleep, the homeless shelters come in, the sleeping uh, conditions at night and feeding the poor and 
all the clothes that you give, they take and make right and, and give it to the poor and make them real cheap. Uh, that's where it all came from. London Bridge now is in Arizona at Lake Havasu. Did you know that? The actual London Bridge where that happened, an American, only an American would do this. I want London Bridge. So he bought London Bridge. And they took it down stone by stone and then put it back together in Lake Havasu across the lake there. And so the bridge where the Salvation Army began that particular part of their ministry is in California now. So if you want to go to California and enjoy Lake Havasu and walk across London Bridge, the real one, then go underneath it and imagine underneath that bridge is where the poor little British people were suffering with no food, no shelter with their kids. And a man of God, his son, said, do something about it. And they've housed probably millions of people by now. And that's who Wigglesworth started his ministry with. Wigglesworth became a children's worker in the Salvation Army. He couldn't talk, but he could take a pony down to the middle of the street with all the little kids in the inner city. And they'd all, oh, we want to play with the pony. We want to ride the pony. And he'd give them two rides, a ride to church and a ride home. And that's how Wigglesworth began his ministry. Now, the ministry that you think of when I say Wigglesworth didn't start until he was after 50 years old. Now, he, uh, he and his wife uh, got gotten married, and, and, and she was a feisty little woman. She, was, she got saved at the Salvation Army meeting, and she began to preach immediately, and, and he wanted to, but he couldn't talk. But they got along, and he did his thing, and she did hers, but he got the Holy Ghost. Something happens when the Holy Ghost comes on you and in you, and, and it fixed his tongue. And um, he came back home from the Pentecostal meeting and said to his wife, I, I want to preach Sunday night. She almost had a heart attack. Really? She didn't know what had happened. And, and, and he said, well, if you want to, sure. So they introduced him and he got up and stuttered for the first about five to 10 minutes, they said. And all of a sudden, the power of the Holy Ghost came on him and, and fixed his tongue for life. He never had a, a, a sermon again. And she was in the back of the building, and she kind of caused commotion back there. She kept saying, who is that up there? That's not my Smith. What happened to him? That, that's not my husband. Who is that up there? She could not believe what she saw. His family tells me, the great-granddaughter tells me, that when he finished speaking, she came running from the back around and jumped on stage and said, whatever you got, I want it. What is this? And she gets the Holy Ghost. And so that's how... They become a spirit-filled power couple of Pentecost. She dies on the doorsteps of the church when Wigglesworth is 51 years old. Kind of early for someone to depart, but they married her. And um, he's home at 70 Victor Road in Bradford, where he lived. And he's in his, what they call the parlor, we call the living room. And across the living room was the desk where he and his wife used to take care of the mail and things with the church. It was their working desk. And on his desk was a four, five-inch stack of envelopes. And he was grieving. You would, I don't care how spiritual you are, how known as you are, when someone leaves you like that, you're, you're going to feel it. It's the natural side. Now, the Lord will help you get over it and get through it, but you're still going to feel the grief. You're going to feel the loss, the absence of that person, especially your wife. And he's grieving, and he gets up out of his chair and walks across the desk and picks up those envelopes. And the Wigglesworth, you and I know, starts at that moment. He said, I will go to these places, and I will give my life to do the double the work. And he becomes the great apostle of faith that we call him today. And he goes around the world bringing Pentecost to South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, comes to America many times. And he's kind of a... An interesting character, he, um, he, he prays for people kind of abruptly. Not all the time, but enough to where it becomes a part of his legacy. Uh, he, he will hit people sometimes. Bam! You know, and sounds kind of funny because he's not live right now hitting you. That's why you like him, because he's dead. He's not here tonight. Bam! It, 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 I wonder if you'd like him if he was alive. I wonder if we'd, we'd like a lot of these people. We, we like them because we, we, we read them and go, oh, wow, that's exciting. Yeah. yeah, it's exciting, but what if you're the next person in the prayer line? He just punched this guy and you go, I'm healed. I don't need no prayer. I'm fine. <laughs> I, I'm sure people are like, 
Oh God, he's coming. How do I get out of this prayer line? Rapture, please come and get us something. They asked him one time, why do you, and he didn't hit people in every service, but when he did do that, it became big news. And it always worked. You can't just do that off of, the, off of your will, but it was really a working of miracles kind of gift you want to look, think about. It. It's odd, but it worked. And they, why do you hit people? Because I don't hit people. I hit the devil. They just get in the way. <laughs> you got to love his sense of humor. You, you want to hear another story? I'll preach my sermon in a minute. It's Friday night. What are you going to do in town? Church is better. And I came, and I'm in no hurry. I don't leave until tomorrow morning, so be, be happy. <laughs> the first person he raised from the dead, he raised 23 people from the dead that we know about. The first person he raised from the dead, guess what the guy's name was? Lazarus. Isn't that kind of funny? So kind of goes with the Bible story. They'd ask him to, to come and, and to pray for this man that was dying, but he got there kind of late and he was already dead. When he got there, the, the wife and the children were crying and they had put the sheet over his head in the bedroom and, and shut the door and they were in the living room and, and, and you know, they're going through the process. Daddy's dead, hubby's gone. And Wigglesworth walks in and he's, his personality is already unique plus the law of faith makes you unique too. He goes, uh, where is he? The wife goes, well, he's dead. He goes, I didn't ask how he was, I asked where he was. So she walked him down the hallway and he said, now you can't come in, you're full of unbelief. She said, well, how do you know? You've been crying the whole time I've been here. That's unbelief. You think he's dead. Shuts the door, leaves her in the hallway. Goes in, the dead man is dead with the sheet over his head. Takes the sheet off. You know, they wear those old long nightgowns in those days, you know. And, uh, and that's what he had on. Uh, and, and he picks him, pushes him against the wall and says, live. And he falls down still dead. That's when you all quit and go home. He picks him up a second time and puts him against the wall and gives the command of faith to live. He falls down still dead. That's when you leave town and never come back to this town because you've ruined your ministerial reputation for life there. He picks him up the third time and puts him against the wall and does a live in Jesus' name and gives that command and let's go. And he falls down again, but this time his eyes pop open. Well, my deal is you've been knocking him up and down two or three times. I mean, his eyes can pop open because bing, bang, bing, bang, it's going to happen. But then he, <clears throat> he coughed and he'd come back to life. And Wigglesworth said to him, your family thinks you're dead, but you need to get you dressed. So he helps dress the guy that had been dead for a little bit, put his coat, his pants, his shirt, and his coat, and gets him all dressed up, you know, and walks him down the hallway, says to the family, he's not dead no more, and walks out the door. And that's the, the first man he raised from the dead. Isn't that wild? Great story. Love the man. So I collected all of his unpublished sermons. That's what that book is. Took me 10 years to do that. When people play golf, I hunt old women that have things in their trunk. <laughs> and I find sermons. See, if you're part of Pastor Todd's revival movement, you know what they do for fun? They shoot things. They shoot deer, they shoot turkeys, they shoot rabbits. That's what they do for fun. I don't do that. I hunt old people and I go to, I go to libraries and newspaper places and, and, and I do this. I, I like this better than shooting turkeys and deers and, and I don't play golf either. Who wants to wear those weird looking pants and hit a ball and chase it? You need deliverance if you do that. I can tell who's golfing now by how they laughed. All right. So that, that, that's 850 pages of unpublished sermons and I left in the prophecies and, and the tongues and interpretation. Then I have another, not as big, but another book, but she's from your state. You all know who I'm, Mother Edder. These are all of her unpublished sermons that I found and put them in this little book. Uh, she was... In the late 1800s, a healing preacher, back when healing was being pioneered by Dowie and her and a few others, and she's from your state. When she first got married, she married a, you don't mind me giving you a history lesson as I do my book announcements. All right. It's what you get when you invite me. You can't, well, it just goes with the package. And so she, uh, she marries a Civil War veteran. You know, the, so the war was in, what, 1864, 65, what it was. And so she married, and then they, they tried to be farmers. 
and they were very bad farmers. And, and they weren't very good farmers. And they had six children and five of them died. So they really didn't have a very, big, very good, happy beginning. The farm wasn't working and all the babies were dying, but one girl named Lizzie or Elizabeth. And um, so they finally thought, well, we might want to obey the Lord. But women weren't preachers back then. That was a man's job. Women didn't preach. That's why women preachers have always had to be kind of feisty to get through the door, especially back then. So they, they, they decided to, to obey that particular call. She was called when she was a teenager. She was caught up in a vision of a field of wheat, big field of golden wheat. And it began to fall down all around her. And she heard the voice say, many of the Lord shall be slain in your life, meaning they'll come in. And, and so that was something that she had known. But, you know, women didn't preach. They, they made blankets for missionaries and African people. That's what they did. So sad. The only place a woman could preach is in Africa. I don't know why they got all the blessing. And all of us dumb Western people couldn't figure out. God made women. He likes them. That's why there's so many of them. And a woman can do anything a man can do if God told her to do it. If you don't like that, too bad. They're multiplying. <laughs> Women preachers are multiplying. Let them be prophets and pastors and apostles and evangelists and teachers. A woman can do anything. And if you feel called to, as a woman to, to be a minister of the gospel, you can't go to a Baptist church and be a woman preacher. You can't go to most churches and be a woman preacher. They don't believe in them. They don't even let you do communion. But we tongue-talking folks like it. So if I were you and you're a woman, you feel called to preach, leave the dead dumb church you're in and come over here to this one. Because you'll get fed and you'll get blessed and we'll let you obey the Lord and we'll give you money to do it. We like women preachers. We believe in them. The Pentecost or the tongue-talking Christian family is the most supportive of women preachers of all the Christian groups. Now, some are slowly changing, but may I say kind of privately, we're still the best. We go, all of us that do, all that kind of stuff, we like women preachers. We think they're wonderful. And we don't look at you by your gender. We want to know you by the spirit. That's why we first accept you. And, uh, and we have no problem with color or gender or age. We want to know you by the Spirit. And in the last days, one of the great end time signs is the rise of women being used by God. In the last days, your sons and daughters shall speak by inspiration. And that's a sign of the last days. So I get happy. So this is her. Marie Woodward Edder, she, she got ordained here by a group called the Church of God. They weren't full gospel. They were kind of dead. And they're still around. I don't think they're much lively either, anymore either. You know, it's amazing how dead things stay alive administratively. You'll get that next week. And um, so she sought ordination among them, and, uh, and she kept pestering them. And they didn't know how to get rid of her. So they decided to ordain her and send her to the worst place that they knew where revivals and church plants never work. They nicknamed it the devil's den. They sent her there not knowing they're about to launch one of the greatest women preachers of that time and of our all of time. Because there was no cell phones and movies and streaming channels. So they heard a woman was coming to preach. Have you heard the news? A woman is going to try to preach. They all showed up to see the phenomena. She had a great crowd. Best crowd ever. They came to make fun of her, but she took it serious. So she preached a strong gospel message. Nobody got saved the first night, but it didn't bother her. They all came back because she's going to keep going. See, in those days, they preached until it broke. We preach until we're tired and we have to go home. That's why there's a difference in revivals and territorial changes. You know, they would stay, sometimes she would stay places and for six weeks and preach twice a day for six weeks. And I'm just doing the book announcement and you're already wondering when am I going to quit? Think about that. So about... Third night in, it took fire, and people began to get saved. When she finished, she had built a church of 200 people and a strong Sunday school, and that church took off in the devil's den. 
when the guys that tried to get rid of her heard it, they have to give them credit. They woke up and said, we were wrong. And they went and apologized to her. I have to give them credit. And they got behind her and she built more churches for this group than all the brothers put together. Thank God for Mother Anna. And um, she had a, a unique thing in her ministry. I've, I've never seen it anywhere on this scale. I've seen it once or twice happening. God would come into her meetings and put people in trances. Now, I've only seen about two trances in my life, in my 40 years of ministry. She had like 30 a night, and I'm not exaggerating. It was just wild like that. And, 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 they, and it was people saved, unsaved, children, mom and dad, grandpa, anybody. He just hit on. They'd free. You know what a trance is? That's what it is. You, 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 you're... And you may be there five minutes, and some of those would be there all night like that until the next day. She'll read the newspaper articles about her meetings. Wild. And these are all of her unpublished sermons. Mother Edder. She's the grandma of the Pentecostal movement. I wish she could come alive, but she's buried right here in Indianapolis. Her church was here in town. They burned down after she had died. Wigglesworth would come there and preach. You want to hear a little more about India? I got a great sermon. Give me a minute. Let me tell those other stories. Because sometimes you don't know who you are because that's why you believe all the stupid stuff. You don't know who you are spiritually. You don't know where you come from. And, and you're trying to find, you know, the, the individuals that define you or, or what your DNA is spiritually. As much as I love Billy Graham and all the great Baptist people, I'm not a Baptist. I love them, but they're not my DNA. I'm a tongue-talking Pentecostal like most of you. And I like everything about it, even the weird stuff. I know Pentecostals have more weird things than most churches because we allow stuff that you don't allow. We allow people to learn how to flow in the Spirit in our services, which means they make it sometimes, and then sometimes they go, oh my God, I can't believe they did that, but they did it. And that's why we have some oddities at times that Scare other people almost to death. And if you die, we can raise you in our church. We know how to do that. So, you, so there's, there's no problem about getting you back from the other side if that happens and shocks to you. Amen. If you're raised Pentecostal, you talk like this. I saw God do some stuff. I saw the devil do some stuff. I saw flesh do some stuff. And then some things I saw, I don't know who did it, but I saw it. That's called a Pentecostal, you know. Anybody can identify with that? you like, I was raised, to, as growing up, when I went to my friend's church, I was over, you know, visiting my friend or something, and go to their church on Sunday. If you didn't fall down, we didn't have church. You had to at least fall down. See, when we grew up, we played church called the touch and fall game. I touch it, you fall down. And we had catchers. And so that's how we, we played basketball, baseball, and church. That's what we did. I love my life. It's so good. I wasn't abused. I was trained. Mom and grandma did a good job. So wonderful. The Pentecostal movement is where we come from. She um, was in her older age. She quit traveling. And uh, her body, if you see pictures of her, you can see the wear and tear of the traveling. Because they didn't have BMWs back then or paved roads. It was dirt roads. And she would preach under the tents and all those kind of things. Her biggest crowd was 20,000. So you, you can tell the size of of her influence. And um, there was a young lady, she was 28 years old, named Amy Sim McPherson, had just started. And she wanted to come and see the great mother Edder that had lived here in Indianapolis. And there was a quarantine around Indianapolis because of smallpox or something had, had broken out. And, and they told her, you can't get into Indianapolis. She said, when I get there, God will make a way. Now, Amy just had simple childlike bulldog faith and work. And by the time she got to the border, they had lifted the quarantine just about an hour or two before she got there. So she drove into Indianapolis and went over to Edder's church called the Edder Tabernacle in those days. It's called Lake View Church today, the, 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 of the church. Great, great, great congregation. And, um, and went in and talked with Mother Edder and saw her preach that night and, and had her pray for her. And the great mantle of healing was passed to Sister McPherson from Mother Edder. 
And that man, when Amy died, went to a redhead woman named Miss Kuhlman. When Miss Kuhlman died, it came on the first man that wasn't even an American or a Canadian. He was an Israeli named Benny Hinn with weird hair. And Benny Hinn picked up that, that four-generational healing mantle that we see today with Benny came from Mother Ethel right here in this town. When she was real old and she couldn't walk and do all the things that she wanted to do as normal, on Sunday morning, the ladies of the church, because she lived right next door to the church. You, you don't mind me talking like this. Do, no. You're okay? She, she, her house is right next door to the church. So there's a little, hall, little alleyway, I guess you'd call it, between the church and the house. And the, some of the older ladies that knew Mother Edda had worked with her and would go over early in the morning and fix her some breakfast and, and dress her. She was very old and weak the last year or so of her life. And um, they would put her in a chair and then call the ushers, the guys, the young guys that had muscles, and they would carry her out the back door of her house through the back door of the church and bring her up and put her on the on stage on the pulpit area, and they'd start the service. And they'd start singing and doing everything, and when she felt the anointing, she'd come alive. She'd stand up and she'd preach like a young woman, a whole service. When it lifted, she fell back and became an old woman, went back in the chair, and they walked her back across the hallway back into the house and put her to bed, and then she'd come out next Sunday and do the same thing. And that's how she lived the latter years of her, last year of her life as a minister and a pastor of that church. Is that kind of fun? You don't have to die in a hospital. Die in a chair that they're carrying you back from church where you just preached the last sermon. You know? Die dramatically. You only die once, so die dramatically. Have fun with it. Yeah, you didn't get that. So I'll say it again for the folks way over there. Die dramatically. You only die once, so have fun when you do it. Don't die on some type of pill that's got you out. Have some fun. The Old Testament guys, when they died, they called their families together and blessed them and gave up their inheritance and drew up their legs and died. That's the way I want to die. I want to die when I get done preaching and scare people in the altar that night. <laughs> Even in my death, I'm going to get somebody saved. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. 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 Charles Capps was one of the great Word of Faith teachers. He died a few years ago, maybe 10 years or so ago. The Lord told him he's going to die on Sunday. So he called his family in and said, I'm, I'm leaving on Sunday, so y'all need to come. It's my goodbye. So the whole family, kids, everything came. And he went through his office to say thanks to all of his staff. And they didn't all quit, quite get what he was saying. Thank you for helping me and I appreciate you working in the ministry. I'm leaving on Sunday. And they thought he was going on a meeting. They didn't know he was leaving earth. Some picked up on it and uh, on Sunday they got the message. And um, so he said bye to his staff on Friday. Thanked them all personally. Went down to their desk and did all that and went home on Saturday and talked to his family and told them what he needed to tell them and rejoiced and had good memories and died on Sunday. Just like he said. He left. That's how you should die. I'm dying on Sunday. Yeah. Y'all need to come so I can tell you my last bit. And yeah. if you need to get anything straight, let's get it straight. Yeah. Yeah. And please hand out your money and all your stuff while you're alive so they don't fuss when you're dead. Yeah. Or spend it all before they get it so you can at least enjoy your last years of your money because half of these idiots aren't going to do anything good with it anyway. <laughs> yeah, praise the Lord. <laughs> so that's interesting. Or Roberts died. In a hospital, he was 92 years old, and he had fallen. Now, when you're 85 plus, if you fall, they always take you to the hospital. Period. Please go, and they'll help you. Oral had fallen uh, and had hurt his tailbone, and they took him to the hospital. And Richard, his son, and his daughter Roberta, and some of the family flew to, to California, where he was. And uh, they came off the the elevator, and you're supposed to be quiet in a hospital. And he wasn't. That there was noise on that floor, and they thought, "Well, what is going on? Somebody's really be in pain or something." And they got closer to Brother Roberts's room, and it was his room. He was making all the noise, and the doctor happened just to be coming out of his room on his rounds, and and noticed the family was there, and the and the and the doctor goes, "Can you calm your dad down? We don't want to shoot him and knock him out because he don't need that, but he won't quiet down." They said, "Oh, we'll, we'll talk to Dad." So they go in the hospital room, and he's singing all the old tent songs of his youth. All the tent songs they would sing in the big tent as loud as he could sing it. He's singing it, and, and they get, not, Dad, shh. 
You can't be that. I goes, no, I'm leaving today. They go, no, no, no. You'll be here for a couple of minutes. He goes, no, no, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. And he made them sing with him. So there they are. Now, they, now there's more noise than there used to be. Now they got several people there. And he made them sing all the old tent songs. And they messed up. They had to start all over from the top and sing it again. <laughs> he had this song he said on TV called, Something Good's Gonna Happen to You. He changed the words, Something Good's Gonna Happen to Me Today. I'm going home. And he sang those songs for hours with his family. He went to sleep and died and went to heaven. That's the way you die, folks. You die. Remembering, I did what God told me to do, and I liked it. I enjoyed it. That's how you die. You don't have to die the other ways or what people think. Wigglesworth died at a funeral. Think of that one. Why am I telling these stories? Is somebody going to die tonight? Is that why we're talking about this? All right, maybe I'm prepping somebody. I don't know. You know how Wigglesworth died? Wigglesworth died at the friend's, his friend's funeral. He was in the back room taking his coat off. The pastor was going to officiate the, the, the funeral and um, had his back to him. And he'd asked Brother Wigglesworth a question and he didn't respond in a normal pace that you would. And he turns around just as he's starting to fall to the ground and he grabs him. And Wigglesworth died in the pastor's office at the friend of the funeral. That's how he died. He just took off. Just take off. Summerall died similar. The last year of his life, he knew he was going to die. And he went around the world preaching this sermon. Goodbye, earth. It's been nice knowing you. He came to my church the last time and He's in the back seat of my car at the hotel where I had put him up for the night. He said to my associate pastor, he said, get out of the car. I'm going to talk to the pastor. He was kind of gruff. He was my spiritual dad. And I loved him very much. But you had to have a certain temperament to be able to be around him or you couldn't handle his disposition sometimes. But I was raised by bossy women, so a bossy guy didn't bother me. So I, I, I could handle that. And... Um, he said, I can't come back and preach for you no more. I thought, well, what did I do to cause this decision to be made? Then he said, because I, I'm going to die soon. I thought, well, don't die in my car. I, I, I don't want to be the place where Brother Summerall dies. And uh, he knew he was going to die. And he went around the world giving us our last blessing, his spiritual sons. He said, you can come where I'm at. He said, but I, I will not be alive to make my trip next year as I always do to you and uh, he blessed my life he laid his hands on me the last time and prayed for me and blessed me give what you have spiritually away so when you leave the earth you're empty and you're ready for a heavenly infilling of the other side can you say amen all right that's my long introduction I have all these other books get them be happy give them to your friends and get them free and bring them to my meetings and we'll throw them on the floor and cast the devil out of them I can tell only three people laugh. That means deliverance is required in this church. All right. Everybody good? All right. If you never heard me preach, uh, my introduction is kind of um, a false sense of what you're about to get now. Open your Bibles to the book of Hosea. And I know I've pre talked for 30 minutes, but what are you going to do when you go to home? Nothing. So just stay here and listen to the gospel for a while. Thank you for the laughter of the pastor's wife. All right. Hosea 4, 6, you find that in your Bible or on your phones. My people, God's people, they are destroyed because they don't pray. Is that what it says? No. My people are, are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. All right? Look at me. The number one reason why you're suffering tonight is because you don't know something. There is a lack of understanding about a situation or something in your life that creates that destruction, that cycle of failure that you've accepted because that's just the way it is. Grandpa was like this, daddy was like this, I'm like this. So you're all three dumb. You all three live in ignorance and accepted some failure 
some destruction and you made some false doctrine out of it. Like, well, this is God gave it to me to keep me humble. He can keep you humble without torturing you. He can keep you humble without you being in pain and suffering. The number one reason why Christians suffer is not the devil. It's the lack of understanding. My people, God's people are destroyed. Isaiah said they are tortured because they don't have knowledge. If you don't know that something exists, you'll never reach for it. If you don't know how to get something, then you'll never have it in your life. And then religion is so stupid itself. It makes up statements that sound real pretty, but they're real demonic. Like, when you're sick and dying, yes, uh, what's happening? Well, I'm learning something. Well, what are you learning? I don't know. Then you're not learning nothing. So that is a stupid statement. I'm suffering and I'm learning, and you can't tell me what you're learning. It's called dumb. Yes, I'll use that word a lot of time because that's what it is. It's called stupid dumb. You make up a statement that sounds real nice with Christian people who are also as ignorant as you about that subject, and they think it's okay. If you can't tell me what you're learning, you're not learning something. A broke man that is drunk and high on crystal mass knows it's good to have money, but a Christian that speaks in tongues can't figure that out. No, I can tell somebody like, you came, you can't leave until I'm done. <laughs> All right? So, let me say this again. 90% of Christian suffering is a knowledge issue, Amen. a lack of knowledge. And people make up stupid religious statements to make their suffering somehow Look glorious when there's no glory in it. God gives you grace to get through your weakness. God makes a path to make you strong. He made a path to get you healed spiritually, emotionally, physically, socially, and he's made a path for you to have money. So instead of staying broke and sick and stupid, why don't you learn something and get healthy and prosper and have a good time and bless somebody. I think he's getting it. Yeah. <laughs> See, when black people get it, they stand up and say, man, white people just look at you. <laughs> so, some of you act black tonight, would you please? <laughs> all right, let's go to third John. I know I say all kinds of things and I don't repent. <laughs> third John, the little book of third John, the epistle third John. Verse 2, I'm sure you're familiar with the verse, but let's read it again. The third epistle of John, verse 2, Beloved, or my fellow Christian, I wish above everything that you stay broke and sick and ignorant. Is that what that verse says? Now listen to what the verse says, because what I just said is what most people really believe. Okay, that's how they live it. That's how they live it. He said, beloved, I wish above all things. Now, that's a lot of stuff, all things, that you prosper. That's the opposite of broke or surviving. I want you to prosper and is a conjunction that connects that thought to the next thought, which means it's continuing. He says, and healthy. Uh-oh. When I first started preaching, I was told there were several things you shouldn't preach about. You shouldn't preach about people's children. You shouldn't talk about sex and money. And as a pastor, I discovered we should preach about all those things a lot because there are so many goofy things going on in people's bedrooms. Like for one, they're not in the same bed. Let's talk about that. My, I, I built my first church when I was 26 years old in California, grew it to about 2,000 people. And I discovered after a few months that my single people were sleeping with everybody. Now I'm exaggerating to a point, but they were very active. And my married people were not. They weren't even in the same bed. 
I called my, my older pastor and said, I have a problem. My horse and cart is backwards in my church. Oh my God. The folks who can do it don't do it, and the folks who shouldn't do it are doing it all the time. <laughs> I said, I think that's called sin. I need some help. Because <laughs> I got a whole bunch of crazy people. And the guy goes, oh, that's about right. I said, what do you mean that's about right? He goes, well, that's what happened. I said, well, no, I can't have that. Yeah. What you don't preach about, pastors, yeah. becomes a plague in your congregation. Yeah. All right? So, let me say it this way. Whatever a pastor won't teach on, that's where his love for you stopped. Okay? So, if you go to a church that never preaches and gives an altar call, they're not that concerned about your soul. All right? Some people just like preaching. Please, with your preaching, please preach the gospel. It'd be nice if you preach the gospel with your preaching. They never talk about healing. They don't care about you physically then. They don't preach on finances and God's will for to help you and how to work with him and that and the work ethic that's in the Bible. They don't love you that way. Always remember, go to a church that preaches everything, even the part you don't like. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And find a guy or a girl that preaches so bold it makes you happy or mad. Yeah. That's when it's yeah. working for you. It is, well, that's nice. It has done nothing for you. Well, that's a sweet little word. The word don't need to be sweet. The Bible says the word's like a hammer. We want it to break the stuff off and break open the door so the blessing can come into your life. All right? But the, the third thing, it says, I want you to prosper and be in health. I've been in 128 countries. I've preached that many myself, all over the world. Every country I've been in, these two things are needed by the people, whether they're underground Chinese or Singaporean rich. African, European, American, there is a health need and a prosper need with most Christians. All right? The reason why it's at that level because the preachers and the teachers don't teach what the Word says about those things. All right? And it says here, the latter part of verse 2, even as your soul prospers. What is soul prosperity? That's what I mean. As your soul, that's your mind, your soul prospers. Soul prosperity means the increase of your understanding. So health, prosperity, righteousness, Holy Spirit, gift of Spirit, all of it, it works for you in the amount that you understand it. As your soul prospers, all right, hold your place there because we'll come back to 3rd John and go to the book of St. John, the Gospel of John, to the 8th chapter. This verse, even sinners know this verse. John 8, 32. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. See, you know it. John 8, 32. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Let me give you the Robert Sutton translation. Now, you judge this. You shall know the truth, and to what degree you understand that truth, to that degree it sets you free. Is that, does that sound okay? Let me say it again. You shall know the truth, and to what degree you understand that truth, to that degree it sets you free. The problem has been we are an inch deep and a mile long. So we don't know just enough to know it's something out there, but then we don't get any depth to it, and we follow the, the parenting of tradition about those subjects from folks who didn't study those subjects. And so we're saying statements because that's what we all say, but they're not biblically based. I want to speak God word. I want to talk like God talks. I want to speak in the language of God in line with God's word and God's heart and attitude toward all subjects. Okay? Okay. You shall know the truth, and to what depth you understand that truth. To that degree, you will be free. Okay? Back to 3 John. Beloved, I wish above all things that you, 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 not them, not those people, you. So you can put your name there. Thou, put your name there. 
I wish above all things that Robert Lairdon may prosper and be in health even as his soul prospers. Put your name in there. Make it personal. Make Bible verses personal. If they're generic, they don't do much for you. When you make them personal, they'll work and plow a road for you and pave a road for you if you make it personal. Your soul prospered. I grew up in a Pentecostal home. My grandparents were Assemblies of God preachers back when they were on fire. Today you can have an Assemblies of God that may or may not be on fire. They may or may not be spirit filled. But back in those days, you were persecuted for being Assemblies of God because you spoke in tongues and shook. And everybody thought you were mentally ill and walked on the side of the street from you back then. That's how my day my grandparents pastored. And um, I grew up in a home that if we got sick, we got healed. Like if we got not feeling good Sunday afternoon, we didn't stay home, get dressed and get in the prayer line tonight and get here because we could go to school tomorrow. Amen. So we, we were feverish, whatever, we'd go and lay on the pew. We might even go to sleep and they'd wake us up, get up there and get healed, you gotta go to school. So we'd go up in the prayer line and the elders, the pastor, hung around, we'd get healed and go to school. So I knew if I got sick, I could get healed. I, I, I saw it, I experienced it. It was a fact of my life. But I was in the back of a Kenneth Hagen meeting in my probably late teens, early 20s. And here's what he said. You won't believe it. I didn't. I thought he was a liar. And I, I love Brother Hagen. If you know what he said, it's a big deal. He, got up and he read this verse and he goes, I haven't had an aspirin since 1958. I thought, liar. <laughs> I had one this morning. Now, I love Kenneth Hagin. I've heard Kenneth Hagin preach more than any other preacher. We lived three miles from his school and ministry. So we were over there all the time. So all these things they say about him is not true. He's a good man and you should read all of his books. If you read his books and listen to him, you'll be better and be stronger. And so for me to say inside, liar is a big deal. Because he's not a liar, but he said something that challenged the way I lived and the way I perceived and the way I thought truth was. I knew if I got sick, I could get healed. I never heard the word health, divine health. He said, now this verse says, you can hear his voice, that you may prosper and be in health. And I've been walking in divine health so long that I've not had an aspirin since 1958. Liar. That's what I said on the inside. I had never heard if they taught it, I didn't hear it. I, I'll guarantee you the church I went to were good people, but they didn't teach this. Divine health. What is divine health? It means that you don't get sick that much. Divine health means, I'd ask you, when's the last time you're sick and it takes you about 20 minutes to figure it out because it was so long ago that, that I, I was a long time ago, but since then, I, I, I've not been, I've been walking divine health. Common sense and divine work has kept me healthy to where I haven't had an aspirin since 1958, and that was in the 80s when he said that. Wow. I never heard there was divine health. I didn't know, but I was walking in divine healing. If I got sick, I could get healed. I knew the scripture. I'd experienced it. I'd help pray. My grandmother and mom, we'd pray for others, and we'd see them get healed. So I was a healing, believing kid. No big deal. Get sick, get healed. Praise the Lord. I'm going. That's the way I live. I never heard, never heard until that night. Divine health is available. And I went, no, it's not. You're a liar. That's what my insides were saying because I did not know. I didn't know it was available. The first time you hear truth taught to you, it normally you'll act like I did to a man that I highly respect, even to this day. Amen. Not meaning to, yeah. but it's just the way it is like, you liar. <laughs> That's not what I know. I only know one thing, divine healing. If I get sick, I can get healed. I did not know that there was a better path called divine health where you do not get sick or sickness is so far between, it's like, it takes a while to figure out the last time you were sick. I did not know that that was available until that moment. And when I heard it the first time, 
I rejected it and accused the messenger of being a liar. Mm, like you're doing to me right now. You're going to love me at the end if you can hang on that long. I didn't know. I didn't know. Because I did trust him. I knew him. I knew his family. I knew he was a true man of God. He had no hidden weird things behind the closets. He was an honest, pure man of God and had proved it over the years. That I, I caught myself like, well, he's not a liar, but I don't know about that. I heard something from the first time that I'd never heard before. And it wasn't an opinion. It wasn't some, something that some guy dreamed up. He read a verse and he said, you see, he didn't say, I want to heal you. He said, I want you to be in health. And it was there. Not I-N-G, L-T-H. Health, not healing. Health. Health. What's that in the Greek? You know, when you raise in the church, you know, is that the same thing in the Greek and the Hebrew? Did they make a mistranslation here? We got, you know, you, you know how you raise their child up, defend your demon, defend your deficiency. And I thought, I'm going to look that up. And I did, and it said the same thing. Uh oh. And I had then to make this conscious thing. Do I want that? Am I happy with just getting sick and getting healed? Or is there something else that the word says I can have if I'll go after it? And then it's in the word and there's other places where this is talked about. I heard great healing sermons, but not health sermons. That was the first one that night in my life. And I had to make a decision. Do I want this? Now, I don't have to have it to go to heaven. I can live a nice Christian life, and when I get sick, get healed and be happy. But I have this attitude. If it's in the book and I can have it, I want it. I want all of it. I want it as big and as loud and as much as I can get. I want it. So are you a hyper-faith guy? I am. I'm hyper. I'm bionic. I'm nuclear. Any kind of faith, I want all the stuff I can get. If it's for me, I want it. And I don't care if my faith scares you, I'll just get some new friends. I'll come back over here and run under your pastors. Amen? I didn't know. And I was a nice guy. I really am nice. I'm kind of rude when I preach. I'm really a nice guy. You know, I'm like this. I get mad at the traditions that are in your head in life. And I know when I'm talking like this, there's that second voice going, nye, nye, nye. are you sure he didn't say that in a nice way? He, he, he's not really pastoral. No, I'm not your pastor. I'm a guest preacher. I'm leaving tomorrow, so I can be rude and leave. I can be blunt and go home. Sometimes you have to hear something said in a way where it offends the tradition of your thinking and your life to make you jar. Like Brother Hagin didn't say it anyway, but he just made a comment, if you know his manner. But it provoked me. And I thought, if it's available for me today, right now, in this time, then I want it. Now, if you don't want it, that's your problem. Be sick. I want health now. I'm not your enemy, but don't you get mad at me because now I'm believing not to get sick. Well, who do you think you are? I'm a Christian. Who are you? Who do you think you are? I'm Robert Sutton, born again and have rights to everything in the Bible. Who are you? Do you know who you are? Probably don't. That's why you go, mm. I know who I am. I'm born again, a child of God, and he really likes me a whole lot. Now, I don't know if he likes you. You've got to figure that out for yourself. But I know what he thinks about me. So it never goes over. You know, when I teach Bible school, I do it real loud in Bible school. 
to the point I make them uncomfortable and they squirm. I scream for two minutes. He really likes me. I'm the apple of his eye. He really, really, really loves Robert's Laird. Mm, mm, mm. And I just push it and push it and push it to where you think I'm a nut. But I really believe all the things I just said. Now, do you know what God thinks about you? And do you know how God loves you? You have to know that yourself. I can tell you, I can mm, smooch you with you, and Jesus loves you, mm, he thinks you want. means nothing. you got to have that. You can hate me, but I'm loved by Jesus, and that cures all rejection. You can, you can write me up in the newspaper and call me a false prophet, and I'll still have a great day. Because when the God of all goes, I love you, you're the apple of my eye, I'm with you, bam, I'm sealed and you can't touch me, and you can't stop me. If I'm doing right and serving the Lord, we're a bulldozer that cannot be stopped. Amen? And I want to be healthy. Common sense living and biblical walking with the blessing of God's power that gives you divine health. I'm better than I was last year. I'm not where I want to be, but at least I'm not where I was. Well, well, that's that's not when you get to heaven. No, read your Bible, you blind bat. Read your Bible and quit listening to all the stupid things people say. There are things here and now, not just over there. So that's why you like heaven stories and heaven songs, because you can't live now, you want to go to heaven now. That's why Pentecostals always sing the king is coming beyond Jordan, over there. When we all get to heaven, what a day that'll be, yeah, it'll be a great day. And they'd sing it. And you can even preach if you know how to preach. Pentecost out, mm-hmm. When you get to heaven, mm-hmm. There'll be no more sickness, whoa, that's great, brother. And then start shouting and jerking and doing all that stuff. And all you're doing is when you get there, there's no more credit card payments, whoa, hallelujah. There's no more mortgage payments, whoa, I feel that one. And you list this whole thing, it's all true. When we get over there, uh, but you wake up here on Monday. So that's why Wednesday night is for the refueling of heaven songs. When we all get to heaven. Whoa! Because as nice as those pastors were, they didn't treat their sheep right. They didn't tell them to live Monday through Saturday. A victorious life now. Well, mm, like it's you. Well, live how you want to live. I wanted to be healthy. I wanted my days on the earth to be more healthy days than sick days. And they've been like that for a while now. But it took me a while to start believing it and going after it and building it. Then this other word in this verse, help us. You're all okay until I get to this one. Money. That's like cussing in the pulpit. Money. Money, money, money. Money. Anybody die yet? All right. Why is it this verse wants you to prosper? Well, he wants us to prosper in our soul. True. Prosper in our marriage. True. Why do you excommunicate the money side of this word? Where we talk about prosperity, which is in the Bible all through the Old and New Testament, by the way, the prosperity preachers didn't dream it up. It's in the book. Have you read it or do you go blind when you see that word in the Bible and you you don't see it? Some people have temporary blindnesses. And they read scripture that it goes, yep, and you don't see it, yep, you don't see it, yep. And that's why you're broke. This verse says, I want you to be in health, be strong in your body, to live with your families and provide for them and do the work of God and just be healthy and happy. We have to be sick. No, you don't. You don't have to be. 
Jesus paid a price for you to be healed and have divine health. He wants you to have healthy days as your norm. Healthy life is your norm. Amen. And he wants you to have money. Well, so let me ask, answer this question. Are you a prosperity preacher? Yes. Yes. If I wasn't a prosperity preacher, then I must be a debt preacher. And you've had enough of them. That's what some of you listen to every Sunday. It's a nice guy that has no faith in God's money message. But he sure wants you to tithe though. I'm trying. If I'm not a prosperity preacher, what's the opposite? Because there's no neutrality in the spirit. You either are or you're not. Either you're saved or you're not. You're either in the light or the darkness. You're either this or that. So, all right. Are you a prosperity person? What's the other? A poverty broke person. Now, I must say, that still seems to be the most popular choice of most Christians. Because they think they don't have a choice. Because no one told them. No one read that verse to them. And taught it to them like I have tonight. So blunt that you have to choose to say no. And I keep screaming at you. Because your no don't bother me. I met you before you came. 40 years of Christians. They like you until you hit their pet devil. Or their pet lifestyle. All right, you don't have to prosper to go to heaven. Salvation is determined by one thing, your belief in what Christ did at Calvary that settles salvation, all right? And if that's all you want, okay, then you should leave right now because I'm, I want more. Because there is more. I'm going to illustrate the more. There's a story about a family coming from England to America on the old boats, you know, like Titanic boats, before there was airplanes, they would come on the boats to take them a week or whatever it was to come across the ocean. And they had, you know, a different class, first, second, third, fourth, fifth classes on these boats. And so this family had saved their money to come to America, leave Europe, and they bought fourth class, fifth class ticket. And they had assumed that their ticket did not include food. So they brought food for them and their family for the, the voyage. So they're halfway through, as the story is told, uh, the voyage, and every time it's time for breakfast, lunch, they, all go to their, they go to their room and they eat what they brought. And so they're up top the deck and they're enjoying the sunshine on that day and sort of talking to some other people. And the, one of the passengers in the same class that they're in on the boat said, how do you like the food? We find the food's really good. We, 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 like, we like the meal last night. And da, da, da. he goes, well, we didn't have that kind of ticket. You know, what kind of ticket do you have? And they compared tickets, and they had the same ticket. That ticket included three meals and tea breaks throughout the day. Their ticket included it, but they didn't know what their ticket included, so they were living below the standard of what they bought on that boat. You became a Christian, and you're in the Christian family, and you're going to heaven, but you don't know what the rest of the ticket includes on your way to heaven. And that's where most Christians are. They have bought their ticket to go to heaven and didn't read the rest of the ticket. And that's what church is for. That's what a special night like this is for. Not just to come and enjoy coffee. Not just to come and see our friends. Those are fourth and fifth issues. The first issue is to worship God. That is to learn the rest of the ticket and how to get the rest of the ticket to show up in your life and to help you. If no one ever teaches you and talks to you about these things, then you'll get to heaven and meet the folks who are on the same path you were on and they show up happy. And you're like, thank God I finally got here. That's why you're going to show up. They're like, 
What book were you reading? The same book. See, you read your book, they just carried theirs. They just had the family Bible with all the who got married and who died when, that's all that their Bible's for. Okay? And because that's the way most Christians live, when you find a church like this, you find a, someone who's going to tell you the rest of the ticket and how to do it, they get mad. Now, some, like in the Caneo School, I teach in the school from Pastor Todd's school. I have the honor of being one of the professors. And I've had this every year. We call them Baptocostals. They were Baptist, became Pente, and cost them everything. <laughs> Baptocostals. Yeah. Pastor Todd, Karen are Baptocostals. They're good, but it cost them everything. But they got everything back and more besides. Now it's really nice to see how the Lord does take care of you. And I've had students every year cry in front of me, mad that they spent so many years in a church that never told them, didn't even hint at some of these things. A church that'll teach you the full ticket is worth a 20 minute extra drive to get to. A church that'll stand up and teach you in the face of your tradition and your pet devil manifesting why he preaches is worth tithing to. Most people on Sunday go to a church that God himself don't even attend. Jesus don't go to every church in Indiana. He'd like to, but most of them don't like him. Why? He don't follow the order of service. He comes in and does what he wants to do if it's his church. If the Lord and the Holy Ghost is not free, he eventually gets the message, it's not his church. He's not really welcomed. They use his name, a few nice scriptures and psalms, and that's it. It's called a Christian club, not a church. Beloved, I wish him of all things that you prosper, that you prosper, that you prosper and be healthy even as your soul prospers. Well, I don't like the prosperity message and it shows. It shows what you believe and what you don't believe becomes obvious to those looking at you. So we're getting quiet now. Go to Philippians. Are you enjoying this yet? Yes. All right. I don't know what time it is, and I don't really care. It's 9 o'clock, and I bind it. I think when we get to heaven, there's no clocks in heaven. Praise the Lord most high. Everything's just now. Did the early church teach principles of abundant living? Did the early church, did the apostle Paul and Peter and John teach what we call the prosperity message, the money message? Was it from the beginning or was it an American on TV that needed money and made it up? That's the way it's told. Philippians, fourth chapter, verse 14, or verse 15. That'll answer the question that I just presented. Now, ye Philippians know also, now notice the timetable, in the beginning of the gospel, the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Verse 16, in Thessalonica, you sent to me once and again to my necessity. Now watch verse 17. Not because I wanted the money, but I desired fruit that may abound to your account. 
the law of abundance of sowing and reaping was taught in the beginning of the gospel. Salvation first and foremost, the most important. But once you come into God's family, there are righteousness, there are angelic help, there is healing and health. There is so many things that also includes financial and materialistic help from heaven in your life. In the beginning of the gospel, in the beginning of the gospel, this church was one of the first churches to begin to operate and be concerned, became consciously, intentionally working with God about giving and receiving. Not just giving, not just receiving, but giving and receiving. Now look at me. You don't have to be concerned about this. It's okay. But those of us who do, don't you become a critic of us. Go on and live your life your, as you want to. But that usually is not how this works. When this starts working, then those who don't have it working come against it. And they say, you're greedy. So let's answer that question. Can you be a tither and a giver of offerings to God through your church and be full of greed? No. Okay, let me answer that a little deeper. When you give and you tithe, that's why you ask for it first. You conquer the greed factor in the first step. by, And you're giving out of need. You're giving sometimes out of not having much to create much. So you cannot operate in the biblical laws of, of prosperity and be greedy. The way God set it up conquers the greed factor from the beginning. Well, money's the root of all, of all evil and you're lying through your white teeth. Money's not the problem. Money is not the problem. The attitude toward the money is the problem, Paul said to Timothy. It's the love of money is the root of all evil, not money. Money is a means of exchange. It doesn't have a spirit. Money does not have a demon. You do. Let me qualify that. Let me say it this way. Money takes on the spirit of the one that holds it. So if you hold it, it takes on your spirit of a good man and a good couple. If it goes to a bad guy, it takes on his attitude. That money does evil then. Money takes on the attitude of the one that holds it. It does not have a spirit attached to it. There's no such thing as bad, bloody money. That's called stupid people talking. Money don't have a bad, doesn't have a spirit. It takes on, everybody listening? It takes on the spirit of the one that holds it. So would you take money from a hooker? Yep. Would you take money from a drug dealer? Yep. Would you take money from a, 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 a beer company? Yep. I'll take all the money you give me. I don't care where it comes from. Because when it leaves you, it'll take on my spirit of a Christian. When it leaves their hands, it takes on my spirit. So I'll take it all. It'll become happy money with me. It'll become godly money with me. It does not have nothing to do from where it left. It takes on the one that it holds that money. Do you see that? See, it's all these little things. Now notice who claps and who doesn't as I teach this. No, 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 no. I can see you and I'm after you. Yes, I'm preaching about money right now. If you don't amen me, I'm going to be here all night. Okay, I had, I'll tell you a story. I pastored my church in California, grew to about 2,000 people. And um, 
we had a little bit of notoriety hit our ministry because of my books and things. So we had a little bit of notoriety around the country. And when that happens, when you become a bigger light, more people come towards you and also more bugs come too. So it all comes together, you know. So <laughs> we'll talk about it later. But so you get all kinds of phone calls. So my receptionist, you know, gets all the good calls and bad calls. And so she just kind of sorts it out and throws the bad calls in the trash and goes on. Well, some guy called and said, tell the pastor to be out behind the church after Sunday morning service. We're going to bring him a, a gift, a package. Well, she thought it was a quack, threw the message in the trash. So my head usher was helping us clean up after service, was taking the trash out to the dumpster out back, and they thought he was the pastor. Walked up and handed him a brown paper bag, said, here, and walks off. You know, strange boy. He opens it up. It's full of $100 bills. He walks in my office and goes, I had a strange experience by the dumpster. <laughs> I said, this might beat you up. This might mug you. What, what happened? You know, that you, I got this bag. He says, look. And I dump it out on the desk. It was almost, what, twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000 when they counted it. I like that bag. That, <laughs> That bag made me happy. I thought, but weird. No note, no nothing. Just hundred dollar bills all pushed in this bag. So what'd you do? I took it. Yeah. What'd you do? I spent it. Did the ministry with it. Next month, she got a call again. This time we remembered it. Last time we heard this, something happened. So I said, my usher, I said, go back out there and see if we get another bag. And we did. We got another bag with another seven, eight, nine thousand dollars in it. And every month, for almost a year, not quite a year, but almost a year, the bag minister came once a month with money in it. And it was always thousands. It wasn't hundreds, it's was thousands, like fifties and hundreds. Thank God there was no ones and fives and tens, fifties and hundreds. Those are anointed bills. Mm. Oh, liven up. Some of you haven't laughed one bit since I started, all right? And so I, I, I went out there, and we grabbed the guy, stopped him, and said, listen, we know you're being sent by whoever does this. I said, I would like to meet him. Could he come next time and meet me for five minutes? I'll come back here. I just want to say thanks, tell you what I did with the money, and ask you why. Because after a while, now the mystery yeah. is almost more shocking than the money. <laughs> it keeps coming. I keep taking it, but like, why is it coming? I mean, thank you, but what's the deal here, you know? He goes, well, my, my boss don't want to talk. I said, then I don't want your money no more. My usher went. <coughs> <laughs> I said, then, then if he doesn't come, don't bring the money. Give it to somebody else. And he walks off. I said, well, we'll see. But he came next month. And I got and sat in his car with him. So I sat in the car with him. I said, I'm Pastor Roberts, and you've now given me close to over $100,000 in cash. I like every dollar. Thank you. <laughs> you helped us feed these people. You helped us send these missionaries. You've helped us pay the bill on our mortgage, on our pay. So that's what we did with it. I did not take it personally. I want you to know this is where it's at. Here's, here's what you're doing. And we, we appreciate that. But... Why are you doing this? He goes, my mama told me if I don't tithe, I get cursed. I said, but I think you're a drug dealer and a pimp. He goes, I am. When you call them what they are, they say amen. I wasn't being mean, I was just being honest. I said, I don't think you're real righteous. He goes, no. I said, but, I said don't you think mommy was praying for you to fix this too? He goes, no, don't go there. He goes, I have enough problems. I don't need God mad at me, so I'm tithing. <laughs> I, I said, sir. He said, no, pastor, leave me alone. I said, no, I will not. Hear me, least out. Mom 
wants you to live an honorable life before God and before man. You're tithing, but your lifestyle is going to still get you in trouble. I said, please call your mom. Money came for a few more months, and then it stopped. I never heard from him. So either he stopped or they killed him to take his place in the drug world. Now, some people get mad because I took the money. Money, didn't, that money did not have a drug spirit on it. It didn't have a hooker spirit on it or a pimp spirit on it. A pimp owned it until I got it. When I got it, it fed people. It did good things. It did good things for God and for man. It wasn't doing the other. Don't think because somebody lives a wrong lifestyle and they give the church somebody that it's tainted money. Money doesn't have a spirit. Did you get that point? So I think God's going to send some of this church some wild kind of money. And then you don't get all mad and huffing and leave the church because you took beer money or a pimp money. I'd announce it. Pimp money came in today. Praise the Lord. <laughs> See, I can say that because I taught my church about money. And they didn't have the thinking that some of you got right now. Like, <laughs> I get it. I know. I know what I, what, what's going on. He's like, I like you, but mm, I don't know about that point. But I'm gonna show up in your dreams, and you're gonna hear me in my little blue suit and pink shirt go, and I have a way of haunting you in a positive way. Enjoy, should I go on a little bit longer? You're okay for a little bit more. Okay, Psalms 35. Does God get happy when you prosper? This is a big one. You don't want to do something that makes God mad at you. Or God like, mm. you want God to hug you and be happy about it. We want to do things that pleases God. And somehow we think having money makes God mad. If the devil, if money was bad, why don't the devil load you up with it? If money is of the devil and he's come to, to hurt you, why don't he load you up with it? That's not what happens. Psalm 35 is one of my favorite verses on this subject. Are you enjoying? You guys happy over here? Front row happy? You sure? Can I need to move you up here closer so I can grab you? <laughs> okay. Psalm 35, 27. Give me a few more minutes and I might quit. Let them shout for joy. Always know that Christianity is loud. Religion is quiet and deathly. Be glad that favor my righteous cause. Let them say all the time, the Lord be magnified. Or we say, praise the Lord. Now watch this next line. Here's the big one. Which has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. God gets happy. When you have money left over and all your bills are paid. He don't go, mm, let's give them two flat tires and take the rest of that money. Or let's make the washing machine blow up and you have to go buy a new washing machine or refrigerator. That's how I thought when I was a kid. I grew up like, if you got all your bills paid and you got a little extra money, he's got to keep us humble. So he's going to cause some kind of other expense where that money gets used up. And so your savings never gets beyond a certain hundreds of dollars, never into the thousands. Because this breaks, that breaks, this goes, this goes in. That's how I thought. And I just accepted that was life. That's the way it was. I love Jesus. He loves me. We'll go to heaven. And we got our bills paid. And, and, and that was it. I mainly grew up with rescue faith when I was a kid. That's all I ever taught. God rescues you right before everything falls apart. I got rescued. But brother, I got exhausted waiting to be rescued. Thank God I left that stupidity. But for most of my young Christian life and my teen life, I knew God would help me, but in the last minute before it all falls apart, right before they repossess your house, the money would show up just enough to get it current. 
Remember, to get ahead, or pay it off before time. So I'd rescue faith. He'll rescue me right before midnight. And I can preach that sermon real good. Paul and Silas at midnight. The darkest hour in your life. When things look like it's not going to turn around, God will rescue you. Like in Paul and Silas. He shook up those jail and got them free. He'll rescue you right at midnight. I got tired of being rescued. I got tired of being rescued. I was 23 years old and my hair was turning white because I was being rescued. Stress. Is it going to happen? <laughs> Jesus, please come before two minutes. Can you make it three? Some of you in that, that's all I knew about money and God. And God. You tithe, it's his, it's holy. You worship him with it, you honor him with it. I didn't know about him blessing. I just thought, I didn't want to be cursed. Amen. I was taught to tithe and I was happy with it. And all I knew, he would rescue me. When I got in trouble or somebody of my friends got in trouble, God would come through right before they repossessed the car or the house, right then. <laughs> You're almost on respirators trying to get through the whole thing. But he'd rescue you. That's all the faith I had. That's all I was ever told. You build faith by what you hear and what they show you in the Bible. And they only showed me rescue money stories. How sad it was. Rescued, rescued. I'm here, but I was rescued last night. <laughs> Praise God. I don't know how we're going to meet the bills next month, at least this month. I was rescued. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And that's what we would testify. We had testimony meetings in those times in our church. You could sit and testify. And all money stories were rescue testimony stories. No one ever said, I have 100,000 extra in my bank, and I'm going to Hawaii. We'd have thought that was a devil. We want to cast that out of you. That Hawaiian spirit, come out in Jesus' name. That's how we thought. We were so stupid. Like some of you. Because you've never heard. No one ever taught you about another way of living. God loved me enough to rescue me. That's all I knew when it came to money. Other things, different. I didn't have a problem with my salvation. Never doubted that I was going to go to heaven. Never wake up think, am I going to hell? Never crossed my mind. For 54 years of my life, I'm 58. Never. I never had a problem with that. You, you, you're going to hell. I just have, <laughs> really, that's funny. But no one ever told me about money. All they told me, tithe. It belongs to Jesus. Don't you eat it. Don't you spin it. Give it to Jesus. He watches. And it always sounded like he was mad when he was watching them. <laughs> it wasn't a happy watch. He was like, mm, you better give me that extra penny. I and mean, that's the way it sounded to me. Right. Now, I don't know how we're y'all, but that's the way it came from me. Right. And that's how I grew up. Now, I love Jesus. I'm going to heaven and I, I, he heals people. And I, I, I like all of that, and I don't mind helping pay for your crusade and give money to buy the things of the church. I mean, I, I was all in. But no one ever told me I could have extra money and God would be happy. I didn't think he wanted me to have anything more but just enough. I thought a verse. A verse. My God, a verse. Not a tradition. Not a saying we all say in our stupid church. A verse. A verse. Wow. You don't. Find a verse unless you read the book. Or you come to a service like this where somebody will slap you with a verse, where it'll haunt you for six months, and then you'll get it on the seventh month, which I'm hoping will happen tonight. You'll either love me or hate me so much that you won't forget it. This eternal sermon, I don't know how to close. So you might just have to leave and I'll just preach into empty chairs, you know. Let's go back to verse 26. Are you having fun yet? Are you way over there okay? All right. Are you okay with your hand over your mouth? Are you all right? Is that a happy hand or oh my God? Which has pleasure? Which gets happy? Which is thrilled? 
when his people prosper. When, so God does not get mad when all your bills are paid and you have money with some zeros behind it. Just sitting there making interest and going, hi, hi, I'm here, I'm yours, I belong to you. And no one's going to take it. My refrigerator's not going to blow up. My car's not going to fall apart. I have a life that God is not mad at financially. Because you don't want to have something God doesn't like. If God's against it, we don't want that in our life. We work all the time to become pure and get all the stuff out. Well, here's one you can embrace. He has pleasure when you prosper. When your bills are paid on time. And you look at it and you got enough to go to Hawaii next month on. (laughs) Or whatever you want to do. Sometimes I just want to look at it like, I like having ownership of that. That's mine. Mm -mm -mm -mm. And God's going, "Mm -mm too. That's my imagination working. But something like that is going on, God has pleasure. He doesn't get mad when you prosper, your business prospers, when your church prospers, when your church has enough to finish its projects and money left over. Catherine Kuhlman, I want this in my life. I haven't got there yet. She's the only ministry that I've studied that had to have board meetings on what to do with all the extra money she had. I thought, can I have a year like that? I've been close, but not quite. But she had used to have board meetings. Like, we've got all this extra money. It's God's money. It's not mine. So we need to get together and find out what God wants us to do with his money. I want that experience. <laughs> Anybody else want to have that kind of experience? To be on a church board or a meeting where like, we got so much money, elders, we've got to have a meeting to know what to do with it all. Each Tuesday thing, we don't have enough money. How are we going to budget? That's usually what the elder meetings are about. Yeah. Let's believe for one of these other ones. Yeah. Wouldn't that be fun <laughs> for the... For the pastor, the elders come to the church like, we have so much money. Last night, we decided what to do with it. We're doing this, this, giving it here, and doing it. Because you have so much. Yeah. You know what Ms. Kuhlman did with her money? She'd call Oral Roberts and say, how many of your students are happen to be dismissed from the college because they can't pay their bill? And she would pay yeah. their bill until they graduated. Wow. As long as it still does it. Wow. And still, as long as you didn't tell people it was her. She says, what she did. I know because I'm inside the family of Robert, so I hear everything. And she'd call Oral or have her secretary call his secretary, Ruth. How many students are being kicked out this month or whatever it is? Don't. I'm sending a check. Pay for all of it. That's called fun. That's called God and you and money. Her TV bills were paid. Her secretaries that she had that was paid. Everything was paid. She had all this money, and it wasn't, it was, she didn't have ownership. She was a steward of it. Yeah. What am I supposed to do with all this money? She gave to the Blind Society some. She built a lot of churches in the third world as long as they wouldn't put her name anywhere on it or say it was hers. She paid for hundreds of churches in her life overseas. Built them, built schools, medical schools, Bible schools, with the money. And she just wore a white dress and stood for four hours in front of thousands of people and they all got healed. And she goes, ah, praise the Lord. And go, oh, what a life. When she got done with a, after she got done with a four hour, five hour miracle service, she'd go have dinner with her friends. They'd ask her, aren't you tired? She goes, why? I didn't do anything. Think, think about that. Oh I'm exhausted after this one. I'm like, I need to go rest. She had a four, five hour miracle service with 10, 20,000 people. Stand there and sing in the white dress and watch God heal people and testify and give an altar call and go back to her hotel and change out of her white dress and go eat with her friends. Just as happy as she can be, not tired at all. Aren't you tired, Miss Coleman? Why? I didn't do nothing. I just stood there and watched everybody. God do everything. <laughs> we still don't get it. The red-headed woman told us so much and we still don't get it. All right, let me try to end with this. 
When you teach on prosperity and healing, there's a famous guy in the Bible called Job. Ever heard of him? Job's famous. He's the hero of all the broke, sick, dying people. Yeah, he was rich, but I was preaching this one night in a, in a Calvary Chapel church in California. I didn't know they didn't believe this. That's how I found out they didn't believe it. I was preaching on these lines, and I, they weren't as happy as you were. I could tell they were, mm, I thought, well, my last time here, so I might as well just go for it. So I just went at it. I knew they were never going to invite me back, so I just <laughs> took both barrels and, <laughs> and went and had a good time. So pastors in the future, if you find out they're not going to invite you back, then just make sure they never invite you back. And so I just preached healing and prosperity to the umph the green and happy all by myself because I knew they were going to kill me when I walked out. And they did. I've never been invited back, but I had a great time. And um, so this lady, oh, let me read this. Go to, go, to, go to Job 36 before I do this. You won't believe there's a prosperity verse in the book of Job. A prosperity verse in the book of Job. Oh, no. Help us, Jesus. Job 36, verse 11. If, it's a condition, if they or you obey and serve him, the Lord, they will spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. Oh, my God. It hurts your head if you're a poverty person. Notice the word days and years has an S. Not a day and not a year, but days and Years speaks of lifestyle. If he said a day or a year, that would speak of an event, a moment. But this verse gives us a glimpse into that walking with the Lord, with all the abundances of joy and peace and confidence, along with the financial side, days of prosperity. Years of pleasures. Now that's kind of odd when you look at the verse, years of pleasure. So let me give you the Lairdon translation, you judge it. Give you years of anxiety, free living. Most marriages fall apart because of a money issue, and then another one is sex, and the next one is talking. But right now, money's a big one. When you get in Helping marriages stay together, it's usually those three things, or one of them, or all three, is the issue. Money's a big one. God says, if you obey me and serve me, if you do that, if you don't, then you don't get the verse. If, if, if you obey him and serve him. Now, most of you do that, it's not a mystery. You serve God, you help God out in the ways that you feel to do by praying and working the church, being a witness, you, you, you do that all the time. So it's not a mystery, it's not a secret woo-woo thing. No, just love the Lord and do good things that God wants you to do and be happy. That's called serving and obeying him. It's not that difficult. It's not that difficult. Just quit thinking and just start doing it and you'll be okay. If you serve and obey the Lord, then you'll have days of prosperity. That's the opposite of broke or barely making it. And years of anxiety, free living. I like both those things. I like days of abundance. And I like to wake up in the morning and not be stressed out. I like to live out my day without all the anxieties and medications that help me be happy, help me be sad, help me go to bed, help me not go to bed, sleep. Just be a happy person in the middle of crazy America who don't know whether they're a man or a woman or a cat. <laughs> Welcome to America, folks. I woke up today, a man, still like it. Anxiety, free living. I'm happy with myself happy with my family, happy with what I get to do for the Lord with what I'm called to do. Just having a good time. Yeah, storms come, but I don't get all stressed because I know the peacemaker that can say, peace, be still, and it all changes. And you know, he still does that. That's verses in Job. Oh, no. 
poor broke people. Your, your broke guy's going to be prosperous. What about Job? Did you ask? That's what that mean lady in that church came and said to me. I was preaching at Calvary Chapel. I saw her walking. I could tell the way she walked. She was going to let me have it. So for me, I've been doing this for 40 years. That's my entertainment. They don't bother me anymore. It's like, oh, if you're going to fight me, then we're going to have a good fight. So I put up my shield of faith, got up my sword. Well, let's go. She goes, I can tell. she waited. I could tell she was kind of steaming behind the person I was talking to before her. So I thought, well, all right, it's her turn. I said, hello. She goes, I don't like your sermon. I said, it's obvious. She goes, what about Job? I said, what about him? Since you're his cousin, tell him. <laughs> and she goes, well, Job lost all his family. I said, I heard that was true. A tornado of some kind tore his house down. I said, that's true too. And he got sick. I said, I heard that too. She goes, I go, and, and you're his cousin. What else happened? And she repeated all that again. Kids died, family, house, sickness. All that's true. All that's true. And that's where they stopped. And I kept going, and, and, and. And she yelled, I yelled back. And. She goes, that's it. I said, no, it's not. I said, open your Bible. She wouldn't believe it was in my Bible. I had to read it in her Bible. The 42nd chapter, turn your Bible, the last chapter of Job. This is Job's financial statement as it was the day he died. The Bible tells you everything, if you just read it. It's shocking what the Bible tells you. It's better than National Enquirer. I mean, King David, great king, one chapter. Kills somebody, commits adultery, and lies all in one chapter. And still dies the great king of Israel. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Figure that one out. You can mess up really bad. And if you repent, God can make everything turn. David, wow, he really messed up. Verse 12, Job 42. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. Now, if we stop right there, that right there destroys Job, the broke sick man forever. He blessed the latter end more than his beginning. But then it starts to list how he was blessed. For he had or he owned, you could say. For he owned 14,000 white sheep, little sheep all over town. 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. Now, there's nothing in that lineup that I want right now. <laughs> so let me explain what this is. That's the way they accumulated wealth in the time, and in some nations to this day, is by animals and cattle and so forth. So we don't, in the Western world, accumulate wealth in this same manner. There's a few people, like my cousin, raises about 300,000 chickens at a time. The only chicken I like is the one I'm eating, not the one that I have to feed. And when you smell 300,000 chickens, your nose dies. And it takes about a week for it to come back to normal because it never has smelt something that bad. It's called the entrance to hell. It's so bad. My cousins have raised chickens on, and their nose can't smell nothing no more. I keep praying for it, but it doesn't work. Be healed. Smell in Jesus' name. Smells good to me. All right. So if you gave me $14,000, I know what to do with that. If you, if you gave me 6,000 stocks in some company, I know what to do with that. If you gave me 1,000 you know, cars. I don't know what to do with that. Right. We live in this kind of wealth. And God 
prospers you according to the wealth factor that we live in today. He's not going to give you a thousand donkeys. He might give an Egyptian that because they live out in those fields. I don't want no thousand donkeys. That's called a headache and a pain in the butt. Give me a thousand restaurants. Give me a thousand apartments to rent out and make money for the church and retirement or whatever. You know, things like that. So I, I want you to see that's the way God prospered him in the time. That's the way the wealth was then. All right? He'll give to us these factors in our time. Okay? So that's the start of his financial statement. Now, if he quit there, I'd be happy. I still want to be his cousin. I, I like Job. I want to be part of Job's family. He gets everything back better than it was the first time around. Well, I want that. But let's read on. You still with me? It's 9.37 and I'm not done. Verse 13. He had also seven sons and three daughters. He had 10 more kids. That's nice. Got married again. 10 more kids. Now watch this. You won't believe this. It's in the book. You will not believe this. You will not believe this. Verse 15. And in all of Indiana... There were no women found as fair as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them inheritance among their brothers. Oh, my God. What? Yeah. What? First off, they were Miss Americas. They weren't ugly people with the warts on their nose. When, they, when you saw Job's, you were like, ah. Good-looking women. Walk slow so we can get a good look. When they walked, people stopped. There were no women. Notice, there was no women found as fair or as good looking as poor old Job's daughters. Think about that. You lost everything and God gave you Miss Americas. Now, the next part's even better. No, we, we, we don't see this, but it's a, big, it's a big deal. He had so much that he gave inheritance to his girls among their brothers. In this time period, women were more property. They were, that's why Solomon had so many wives. He did treaties with other nations by marrying their daughters. It was a part of Solomon's trade deals. Seriously, that's what it was. I still think he had too many. We won't discuss that. We'll come back and discuss that later. So, Job, broke Job, sick broke Job, had so much he gave to his sons and gave to his daughters, and the boys didn't get mad. And want the stuff, they all had enough to where they were content and they were happy that the daughters, his sisters, their sisters, had inheritance. What about you? There you go. Take that. You broke sick people <laughs> who've been told by stupid preachers that God wants you broke and sick. Remember Job? Yeah, you dumb thing. Read the last chapter. You don't read the last chapter. And they try to convince you that this was Job's whole life. His misery was a moment in his life, not his whole life. When you're in a trial, physically, financially, marital-wise, in life, the devil tries to convince you that this is going to stay forever. And that's a lie unless you let him do it. It's a moment. The storms are a momentary thing. It's not a lifetime unless you allow it to come in and rule you. Job, watch this one. Poor sick Job. How did poor sick Job die? After this, he lived, Job, 140 years. <laughs> 140 years, take that. And he saw his sons up to four generations. There's great-grandpa. 
Come over here. Let me tell you a story. I was broke. I lost everything. Kids, house. I got boils. I had goofy friends. Terrible. You don't remember that because you weren't even around. Neither was your dad. So I want you to know, you live in this nice house here. You eat this nice food and you wear those nice shoes you buy in the store that way cost too much, but we buy them for you. Because I'm not broke no more. I was poor Job. Now I'm rich Job. I got good looking girls and my grandbabies pop out cute too. Because we reproduce after our kind. I'm sure Job rehearsed the story to his family ever so often. I want to remind you the God that we serve turned my disaster around. And what was meant to destroy me and my faith became a mountain and a castle of blessing. And you're living in this today, sons and great grandsons and sons and sons and sons. Listen, because I serve a God that has pleasure when I prosper. And he gave me 140 years. It says, Job died being old, I like this, and full of days. His days were full and complete. What about Job? There it is. I don't think he died broke, depressed, Sick or thinking he was a cat. <laughs> what about Job? You got it all back. Two way God prospers you. He gives you a great job. And he honors your giving, your tithing, and your giving. All right? Pastor's going to come here in a minute and receive an offering. And I ask him to wait to the end because I wanted you to be able to act upon what you heard tonight. So I'll explain this so it's not a gimmick to you. If a healing evangelist came tonight, he'd pray for the sick. That's what he does. He preached on healing, he'll pray for the sick. If an evangelist comes and just preaches salvation, he'll give an altar call. If a prophet comes, he'll come and give everybody a prophecy and see heights of your head and angels fly through the sky and they'll tell you all about it. That's what they do. Wonderful people. They take a lot longer than I do, so you'll be happy. But I'm a teacher tonight, not a perfect gift tonight. All right, now, everybody look at me. The way that this thing works is God will cause your job to prosper you. He'll help you get a great job. And whatever you take from your money and give to him out of an honest heart, He'll receive it as a worship to him, as an act of love toward him, and as a seed from your life to him. He told you to do that. And he told you to expect what he said, whatever you sow, I will send back to you as a harvest. But I don't give to get, shame on you. He told you to expect. Now, you cannot be violating what God told you to do as something in error. Every my so, I expect what he said to happen to me. My seed worships the Lord from my heart. My money is an act of my love toward God too and his, and his kingdom. But he said, whatever you sow, I will take it. I will hold it, and I will bless it and cause a blessing that will overtake you to start coming into your life. Now, tonight, when pastor receives the offering, I want you to listen to me. Do not give unless you want to. Do not put one dollar in this offering because you feel like you have to. You only give tonight if you want to in your heart that you're willing to. Nobody give anything unless you're willing. And don't feel bad if you're not willing. Keep your money. Because it won't work for you if you give it unwillingly. Just keep it. Keep it till you're willing or till you get mad or whatever and figure it out later. 
And then how much do you give? Whatever in your heart that you decide that it's the right thing to do. It's up to you. Now, I can come up with figures and try to milk you <laughs> like other preachers have done. Because about this time is for the game start. And that's why people get nervous when you preach on money because what happens to activate it is through giving. That's the way you activate these things. Healing comes, word of knowledge, they don't hands. When you preach it, then you do that. Why is it when you preach on this, you can't do what it says to do to activate that? Do you hear me? All right. So I don't want anybody to give unless you're willing to give. If you don't want to give, do not feel bad, do not feel guilty, do not feel wanted. Keep your money. If you want to give and operate the laws of giving, then do that. What should you give? Whatever you feel like to give. Whatever is in your heart that you feel or the Lord may drop a figure. I don't know. Sometimes it's whatever you want or something. He'll give you a figure. That's in you and him. Okay? Now, the reason why I'm not going to, you got to give me $1,000 and get a double portion of my anointing, which is a lie, by the way. You don't get it that way. But, you know, you can give them to me and be blessed by it and receive a blessing. We, we start doing these things now. To me, that's wrong. That's the manipulation thing. We start promising things that God didn't promise. And people get mad, well, they didn't happen because he didn't say it. Whatever you 